we're given a differential equation represented here and from that we are going to be sketching slope fields as well as using separation of variables to solve the differential equation and then say something about its asymptotic values. So the, here's the sort of information that we're going to find useful and because part A starts with a slope field I've just pre-drawn a grid where the dots indicate where they would like the slope field drawn. Remember, a slope field is simply a series of short line segments at various points throughout the xy plane that represent the slope of the tangent line of the function at that point. And the reason that we construct them is because we are often in a situation where we know the differential equation but we don't know the function. So we can at least construct the tangent lines. So typically we look for some sort of pattern in these functions. And so for example, here we see that if y were equal to 1, assuming x was not 0, that if y is equal to 1 then the numerator is 0 and therefore the entire slope is 0. And so for all of the y equals 1 points, I'm just going to draw a perfectly flat slope. Next, let's try x equals 1. When x is 1, or for that matter, negative 1, the denominator is 1. And so the slope is simply the value of y minus 1. So when y is 2, and x is 1, we have a slope of 1. But in fact, when y is 2 and x is negative 1, we have the exact same slope, because we're working with x squared in the denominator. Let's take a look at y equals 0 when x is 1. That's going to give us negative 1 over 1. So that's a slope of negative 1. And for the same reason, we have the same reason as the case with 2, we also have a slope of negative 1 here. So that just leaves us with these two points when x is 2. When x is 2, our denominator goes to 4. And so our slopes are one quarter the size that they were previously for a given y. And so here we have a slope of negative a quarter, which I'll try to represent by a very shallow line, and here a slope of positive a quarter, which I'll again try to represent by a shallow line. Again, what's important is that we get the relative slopes, so that it's clear that this is a positive slope and that this is also a positive slope, but much less steep than this one, and that these slopes right along here are completely flat. So that takes care of part A. May as well label that. Part B is really the heart of the problem, namely using the technique of separation of variables to solve the differential equation given an initial condition. Okay, so we have a dy dx. I'm going to rewrite what they state up here equals y minus 1 over x squared, and they're also giving us an initial condition of 2 comma 0, which we will use later in the process. The first step, the key step, and the one that's easy to get mixed up on if you're not careful, is to separate the variables. We put the dy and the y-related variables on one side of the equation and the dx and the x related expressions on the other side. Now we're going to need to integrate both sides separately. Let's start with the left hand side. If this were merely dy over y, hopefully you recognize that immediately as ln of the absolute value of y. Because we have y minus 1 instead, formally, uh, 
we have to do a u substitution, namely u equals y minus 1. But because du dy is just equal to 1, we can pretty much do this u substitution in our head, and therefore we can write down ln of the absolute value of y minus 1. Now ordinarily we would write plus c, but we know what's going to happen on this other side. Namely, there's going to be a plus c that results from this indefinite integral as well, and we consolidate the c's. So I'm just going to leave that plus c out for the left-hand side. Okay, now here we have x to the negative 2 power. This is probably a better way to write this, to think about how to do this integral, because we can use the power rule here. And that tells us that we're going to have um, just x to the negative 1 over negative 1, which is the same as putting a minus sign in front, plus c. That's the integration. Our next job is to solve for y. And the first step is to exponentiate both sides. Why? Because we're trying to remove the y from inside the ln function. And uh, the way to do that is to exponentiate. So now we have absolute value of y minus 1 equals e to the negative x to the negative 1. I'm going to rewrite it now that we've integrated back in its more typical form, namely 1 over x, plus c, remembering that this c is in the exponent. Okay, let's just rewrite this, continue this on up here. Okay. So, just rewriting what we had below. Absolute value of y minus 1 equals e to the negative 1 over x plus c. It's very important when you get to this stage that you go back and double check. Make sure you have separated the variables correctly. Make sure you've performed the integration correctly. Otherwise, you risk, if you've made a mistake up until this point, you risk wasting all of your effort from beyond this point. Well, I did double check and I think I've got it right. So I'm going to move on. We've got to remove the absolute value bar. How are we going to do that? Well, removing absolute value, we now do not know whether this quantity itself was positive or negative, but we can express that by putting a plus or minus in front of the other uh, side of the equation. We have that. So now it's the c and the plus or minus that are both two things that we can resolve their uncertain nature by applying the initial condition. And so we do something that's uh, just become conventional. We use the laws of exponents to rewrite this as plus or minus e to the c times e to the negative 1 over x. And in that way, there's only one spot in the whole equation where we have things that can be, whose ambiguity can be determined by applying the initial condition. So finally, I wanted y by itself, so I'll write plus or minus e to the c times e to the negative 1 over x. Now I can apply the initial condition. We have 2 comma 0 as our point. So in other words, 0 equals plus or minus e to the c times e to the negative 1 half. I left out the plus 1 here when I made this transition. Let me put it back in. Plus 1. Okay, so notice I placed the, the 2 in for the x value and the 0 in for the y value. Now, what does this need to be? 
Well, this needs this entire thing here needs to be a negative value, namely negative 1. And that tells us that we're choosing the negative of the plus minus sign. And then it also needs to exactly cancel out in uh, terms of multiplication the e to the negative 1 half. So we'll make this negative e to the positive 1 half. And so finally we have y as a function of x equals negative e to the 1 half times e to the negative 1 over x plus 1. The last question has to do with the limit of this function. Now they called it f of x, so I'm going to also note this is f of x. Again, the distinction between y of x and f of x is a little bit subtle, but basically y of x is the general solution, whereas f of x pertains to the particular solution that we found using the initial condition. At any rate, we want the limit of this as x goes to infinity. So. limit x goes to infinity of negative 1, or rather negative e to the 1 half times e to the negative 1 over x plus 1. Well, this is a constant, of course, so nothing happens to this in the limit that x goes to infinity. Here, however, we have e to the negative 1 over a number that becomes very, very large. Negative 1 over a number that becomes increasingly large tends toward a limit of 0. e to the 0 is 1. And so this I'm going to write as um, just negative e to the 1 half times 1 plus 1. I suppose if we wanted to pretty that all up, we would get uh, 1 plus negative square root of e. And that's our problem.